All right, Yechi HaMelech, ladies and gentlemen, I am Yossi Edri, and I say Yechi HaMelech, which means long live the king. It's, just take it as it is, long live the king. We're giving energy to Mashiach, to the king. Uh, when you speak, it's from your breath. It's, call on Hashemah Tahal Al-Kah, I'll call Nashima on Nashima Shadam Neshem, where even when you sleep, you're breathing. So the Rebbe explains that in the Tanakh, when it says Yechi HaMelech, Yechi Adoni HaMelech David Lo'elam, they're giving power of life to the king. Long live the king. And uh, that's why we're saying Yechi HaMelech, right? So uh, we have to respect everyone's differences. Uh, I'm, I'm a Lubavitcher. It, it is what it is. But we're working together uh, to bring the sun, uh, to bring Mashiach. And uh, Adam, thank you for joining us today. Really a pleasure. Um, so I'm going to give a small summary of what we're doing. You'll give me questions, what you don't understand. And you all, and Adam is also uh, happens to be uh, a veteran of the old guard of the Sanhedrin Initiative. He's been uh, publishing and working very hard on getting the message out of the Sanhedrin for many, many years, maybe even before I was born, possibly. Um, not so long, but okay. not so long. But uh, yeah, we've been uh, we've been hard at work, and and uh, it's very important. It's part of the narrative of the Geula, the light in this world. And uh, with Hashem's help, uh, we'll be matzliach. So, a few points, and I'm going to go over them uh, from from last. What they said in the last interview wasn't uh, addressed. So I'm going to go through those points just to get them out of the way, and then we'll uh, move on in a natural uh, in a natural way. So number one, regarding the smicha of the Sanhedrin, which is a very tricky topic, and you need to have the you have to know what you're doing when it comes to that, because that's one of the halakhic elements that are connected to establishing the Sanhedrin. This is something that the Dayanim are going to have to work out. And till they work it out, it's going to be a Sanhedrin de Yemaisa Mashiach, as you might call it. It's going to be the Sanhedrin of the days of Mashiach, which we, we've already entered according to Gemara, according to. Um, the number two, uh, the reason why we're not talking about law enforcement we're not talking about police, shayftim and shaytrim, but rather we're talking about shayftim and yayatzim, is because in the Geula, we see that it's only shayftim and yayatzim. It's not going to be enforced. People are going to want to serve Hashem. They're, want, they're going to want to know how to do it properly. They're not going to be, need to, they're not going to be needed to, they're not, it's not going to be needed to be enforced. And the opposite is true. If someone has an issue with what the Sanhedrin is saying, They'll come to the Sanhedrin, they'll argue it out, and or the Sanhedrin will admit that he's right, or this, or the person will be convinced that the Sanhedrin is right. And that's what the Yayatim are there, they're like the, the Metavchim, they're like the lawyers, they're like the waiters. They're there to um, lahagish et, ha, et apsak in the proper way. And this is all in a Geuladik mindset. And the whole concept of Shaitarim is a Gullus concept. When you have to force someone with brute force to do things, that's not a Geuladik uh, uh, concept at all. And that's why in, in the Shemona Esra, when we dive in, there's no mention of uh, Shoiterim. Only Shaftaich and Yoetzaich. Hashiva Shaftainu Kevarishenu Veyatenu Kevatchila. That's an interesting... Uh... And uh, three, when we're going to mention the Rebbe and we're going to talk about the Rambam or the Halacha or whatever it is, we're mentioning him in we're mentioning him in relation to the fact that the Sanhedrin need to make a eventually need to crown a king. That's part of one of the things they do, is they establish a king. Um, and if we're going to use the Rebbe for different examples of halacha or whatever it is, it's not because we're trying to make everyone uh, think the Rebbe is Mashiach or whatever. That's a different story completely for a different day, as they say. The point here is that even if we want to say that Chabad Chassidim hold the Rebbe is Mashiach. We also know that before David there was Shaul. Shaul is like from the Lushan borrowed, right? And uh, Shaul was a king. He wasn't from, he was from Binyamin, he wasn't from David, but he was a king nonetheless. The only thing is that we cannot build a base on English if we don't have a king. We need to have a king. And a king Alpi Halacha, which means that he has to be Alpi Din, a Basar of Adam, and Alpi. This, this is another topic that we have to open up, which is very touchy, but we'll have to do it what we have to do. Um, there's three things that we know the world stands on. Ala din, ala emes, ala shalem. The din is the judgment, the emes is the truth, and the shalem is the peace. And they're not the same. 
The din is not the emes, the emes is not the shalim. The din is that if someone doesn't breathe, you put him in a box and you put him in the cemetery. There's no choice. Is that the emes? No. Titan emes le Yaakov. Yaakov avinu lo emes. Mazare v'chaim avhu v'chaim. We know that tzaddikim v'misachim kurim chaim. The truth is that it's very possible that tzaddikim are alive. The only reason is that we don't see them is probably because Hashem has this world and we have free choice. If we would see tzaddikim living forever and we would see the Rishonim being condemned forever, we that would distort our free choice and our and our capability to be mimane amelech out of our choice because we would be coerced into accepting Hashem as king or Hashem's king as king. So we need to understand that the din and the emes is two different things and as far as the Sanhedrin is concerned we're dealing with the din. So we're going to need to have a candidate preferably Mizera David that's a Hege Batera Baisik Mimitsis Kedavid David that the Sanhedrin will be able to say okay this person is a Frum Yid and uh, he can be the king he can even sign perhaps a paper that his Malchus when the Rebbe is, is back the Rebbe will decide if his kingship continues or not as it says in the Gemara that Imin Chayehu Kagarin Rabbi Yudah Anasi Vim Lav Kagarin Rabbi Imin Chayehu Kagarin Rabbi Yudah Anasi Vim Lav Kagarin Rabbi Yudah Anasi Mashiach can be from the living from the dead whatever it takes but the point is a king needs to be established if we are to get the Beis Hamikdash because only once you have a king can you do Mechias Amalek once you have Mechias Amalek you clear out Hab clear out Harabai's area and the whole place clear out uh, the enemies of Israel then you can build the Beis Hamikdash. So the Sanhedrin is the first step, the practical step in the Geula process. That's why it is so important that this be successful. Um, regarding the vaccine mandates, right? Um, the thing is like this. The whole vaccine narrative is a gullus narrative. It's a matrix narrative. It is not the mar- narrative of of the Geula at all. It has nothing to do with Am Yisrael's narrative of the Geula. It's a narrative that the Umm Sa'ilam are busy with and to be honest it doesn't it doesn't make any sense as far as the Geula is concerned. The whole narrative, the, 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 the way it rolled out, the Pachad, because Yira and Ava that people have towards this thing is supposed to be Yira Sashem and Ava Sashem. The fact that people are so scared of this that it even matters to them that much is because they are missing fear of heaven and love of heaven. If they would have fear of Hashem and love of Hashem, this whole thing would completely be looked at in a different light. And therefore the Sanhedrin have to be people that uh, have a backbone and and whether they have whatever opinion they have, it needs to be uh, through dialogue and it needs to be through common sense. They need to be able to argue out their point and if they can prove a point, then that's what the point is going to be. As far as uh, taking a position. Me personally, I did not get vaccinated. I'm not into this whole thing. I haven't worn a mask for the last two years, basically. Uh, I don't buy in businesses that don't that that uh, uh, require a mask. If the police ask me, which they did a couple of days ago, why don't you wear a mask? I say, uh, I have, for health reasons, I'm not involved in this narrative at all. I am not being, I'm not part of it. Um, and as far as this discussion is, it's a discussion. Is it the, the ultimate discussion? We're, we're schmoozing, we're yidden, we're talking about the gula. Um, so this is not, uh, we're not trying to make a new halacha book or anything by what we're doing. Anyway, so uh, Adam, why don't you tell uh, the people who you are and uh, what you're all about. And uh, Sure, if you'll pour me some more tea. Of course. Of Great course. tea. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I want to start with the disclaimer that I do not agree with the several of the points you just made, but it's okay. Um, I want to start off with the actual narrative of how I first encountered the uh, Sanhedrin and how I got involved in all this, and I think that'll help put it into perspective and give my uh, my perspective on it. Um, about six, ago, six and a half years ago, I was desperate for a job, couldn't find a job, and I loved writing. I love writing. It's it's really from my soul. And um, through a great kindness from Hashem, I uh, got accepted to try out for a job um, writing for an organization that at the time was called Breaking Israel News. Um, and the second story I wrote 
uh, my boss handed me, because I was the only one on staff who was very, very fluent in Hebrew, he handed me a brochure, the, a handout for synagogues, that talked about the Sanhedrin putting Obama on trial. And I'm like, Sanhedrin putting Obama on trial? There were just too many things in there for me to, to grasp, but I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm flexible, I'll go for it, and I really needed the job. So um, I made a few phone calls, and I connected with uh, a, a gentleman, uh, Rabbi Hillel Weiss, Rabbi Professor Hillel Weiss, um, who was the spokesman for the Sanhedrin. And yes, they were putting Obama on trial because he, his, his actions against Israel showed that he was rejecting that Israel was in the covenant with God, which necessarily meant that the land of Israel was only for the Jews. Um, and they said that's a rejection of the Bible, which is bad for people and unacceptable for a leader. Um, and I actually went to the trial, and my experience uh, during the trial and after the trial um, was that we're basically just talking about a few rabbis who claiming to be on the Sanhedrin is actually bad for their reputations. It's causing mainstream Jews to, uh, to reject them. These are rabbis who in every other aspect of their life, lives are highly respected. Um, Rav Yoel Schwartz, uh, Rav Steinzeltz, Rav... These are very highly respected rabbis who, as soon as you say, oh, they're on the Sanhedrin, people are like, ah, oh, he's a nut. I was like, well, but, 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 you know, you, you, you trust him with your kashrut, you trust him with your, and everything else, um, which I was confused by. Um, so I wrote about it, and I was shocked to see that actually the Gentiles, the Christians, were much more fascinated and supportive of the Sanhedrin. Uh, the Sanhedrin even made a few um, declarations concerning the UN uh, and their uh, attitude towards uh, the connection between Israel and uh, between the Jews and, and, and Israel and the holy sites. And I was very surprised that the UN actually responded because they were taking them seriously. Um, I kind of disagree with you when it comes to dealing with issues of um, Sanhedrin, um, my, my, my personal approach to it, not professionally, but personally, is that, um, and someone once asked me, how dare you, you know, who are they to consider themselves the Sanhedrin? My attitude was, I don't know, I'm not choosing the Sanhedrin, um, and I don't have the right to choose a Sanhedrin. But what I do have is from the Torah, I have a, a Torah requirement, um, a commandment, a uh, a non-negotiable mitzvah to um, to to lead my life uh, under the auspices of a Sanhedrin and a Beit Din. I am not allowed to use a secular non-Torah court of law. So in that regard, we don't have a choice to pick and choose, and to and they're not elected officials, and they're not they're not part of the government, um, and. Uh, this was, I remember once, um, there was a time when the, 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 the UN uh, called abortion and uh, euthanasia a human right. And the Sanhedrin said there are seven Noahide laws. One of them is against the spilling of blood. Abortion is the spilling of blood. Euthanasia is certainly the spilling of blood. And they said something very interesting. They said that the only reason why the UN existed was they had a mandate um, based in the Bible, and that they had violated that mandate and were no longer suited. In in essence, when the when the when the UN first um, began, it had a, a a right to exist. So it had a it had a blessing, because it was doing something that was based in the Torah. And they even outside of it, they have a verse from Isaiah, from Isaiah, from Yeshayahu. Um, they, 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 they know that they are, are based in the Bible, but by violating this mandate, the only thing that they're not is the, the Torah says explicitly, the, the teachings should go out from Zion. And they're not in Zion. Um, 
which is why they have the ICC, the International Criminal Court. It's not based in Israel. It's not based in Torah. They've violated their mandate. Um, the Rebbe, the Rebbe spoke about the UN, like you said, and in the beginning they had a blessing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, they, they were, they were. They a, did connect to Zion by by helping to establish Israel. Also, they 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 were a bad, They were a symptom of World War II when everyone was sick and tired of seeing the world destroy itself. Right. And and the Rebbe was the Rebbe was also a symptom of World War II. The Rebbe created an army of good and people that are ready to do good at any price all over the world. Um, so and, and the Rebbe spoke the Rebbe spoke positive, positively about the United Nations, especially that it that it was established in New York, which was where the Rebbe Rebbe was, uh, where seven seventy is. So yeah, but obviously the Sanhedrin would would uh, would the United Nations would pale in comparison to what the Sanhedrin can bring as far as spiritual light to this world. So so in that regard, um, my personal perspective on the Sanhedrin was they're helping me to fulfill the biblical commandment that I don't I don't say gee I don't like these tefillin so I'm not going to put on tefillin at all you know it's like you can't say that you can't say I don't like this Sanhedrin so I'm not going to accept them it's a Sanhedrin you can't decide instead to go to the Supreme Court you have to use the Sanhedrin that you have it is your Sanhedrin it is the Sanhedrin if you're a Jew and you consider yourself a religious Jew exactly. and a halacha a halachic uh, for fulfilling Jew, then if you have a choice between uh, a Goyesha court or a Jewish court, obviously you should choose the Jewish court. Um, to be honest, even if you don't, Unfortunately, have, the, if you the, don't have a choice, uh, there's, yeah. there's, Jews are not allowed to use a non-Torah system of law. That is like saying, um, you know, I accept God for, for the chickens that I eat on Friday night, but I'm not accepting God for... Even decisions. more so, according to halacha, a Jew is not allowed to build a, a non-Jewish courthouse um, because it's a chazaka that they're going to sentence so, people to death that are that are that are innocent. And uh, back in the day in Rome, actually, they would build these three-story buildings and they'd throw the the guilty off the roof. That's so, how they would kill them. So, so a Jew is not allowed to build a, a non-Jewish courthouse. So there courthouse. are leniencies. Uh, and go arounds for Jews outside of Israel because it's what they call Dina de Malchut Dina. Because you're living in a foreign land, those leniencies do not apply to Israel um, at all. Uh, we cannot, even if a if a cop arrests me and takes me to court, going to the court is like eating eating pork. It's totally forbidden. Um, we need a a Torah-based Sanhedrin, court of law. Um, yes. The smicha, the, the, before they formed the Sanhedrin, they, they, they did a, a deep study on how to reinstate um, smicha. I believe they did. Um, that being said, uh, when it comes to kings, I also... I'm very much in the same headspace. Just as the the when since the temple was dedicated, we cannot choose a different place for a temple. Um, there's the bracha from Yaakov that says the shevet will the, the the scepter will not depart from Yehuda. So uh, the 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 king should definitely be from shevet Yehuda. <laughs> the king should be from from David from, from David. David. Um, and I was really shocked. Uh, when I did an article, it all started because there was a group that brought a lawsuit um, in the Supreme Court in Israel, and they said, "Look, we have we have documents. The document is called the 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 the, the Bible, uh, the Tanakh, and it shows that King David bought the Temple Mount. So if he bought the Temple Mount, and no one else has paid for it since then." Then his, the Temple Mount belongs to his descendants, mm. mm -hmm. which was an interesting claim. But mm -hmm. I said to them, "Wait a second! There are no descendants of King David." And they looked at me and they said, "Of course there are. There are. This is this is a good time to say that there's the Davidic <coughs> dynasty um, organization. There's uh, headed by what's Susan that? Roth. Susan God Roth. God bless her. She is a powerful, amazing individual." 
who is unfortunately ignored, though she has done so much. And actually, the, I think she, she doesn't like to, to be um, put out in the public eye. She has done so much. She's been an inspiration to me, and she has brought, she's, she's brought us closer to Gaula. She's amazing. Um, and There's there, also another organization in uh, Borough Park, which uh, I just found out about a couple of days ago, honestly, uh, that my uh, friend told me about, which also do this. <clears throat> so, I was, so I was put in touch with a gentleman by the name of Mitchell Diane. He's a real estate developer, I think in Detroit. I'm not sure exactly where, but in America. And I called him up and I'm like, so I hear you're a descendant of King David. And I had always been told that there were no descendants of King David left. So there was no chance for Messiah. And this very sweet down to earth man said to me, yep, I am. And he told me an amazing story about after his father passed away, the Rav of the community walked up to him and said, I have something I have to tell you. And apparently it was a known thing that his family was from the house of David. Um, and then all of a sudden I started bumping into more people. Uh, uh, Rav Yosef Dayan. And then there's uh, Rav Yosef Berger, who's the son of the Mishkoltz Rebbe, who I'd been in contact with for a couple of years. And I happened to mention to him this story, and he's like, yeah, me too. And I'm like, get out of here. So all of a sudden, in one week, I went from there's no people from the house of David, so it's gone, to all of a sudden, my gosh, is there anyone out there who's not descended from <laughs> King David? Um, so again, um, I don't, it, it's called, I think, um, cafeteria religion, which is picking and choosing. Um, and Judaism is really, really not cafeteria religion. Um, and I'm, I've been amazed more and more, and I think this is actually a galut, an exile mentality. Uh, the Judaism is, Torah is what we have from Poland um, back in the day. Um, and there are things that, so we have Malchut David. What is stopping us from reinstating it? It's the Gullus. It's the Gullus mentality. Do, do we have? Are we are we short on rabbis? Is there a shortage no. of, of of amazing rabbis that could sit on the Sanhedrin? No. Are we? You know, this is. This, We're not in Gullus anymore. Wake up! Right. That's what the we need. The only thing, I, actually, I was shocked to find out that. Okay, I, when it comes to korbanot, to, to sacrifices. Um, everyone says, oh, but we're ritually impure. We don't have the, the paradumah, the red heifer, so we can't bring them. That's a lie. Um, we are not only able to, but required, required at every moment to bring a public sacrifice that is time-bound. Even in impurity. Impurity does not put them off. Those public time-bound sacrifices, twice daily sacrifices, Corbin Tommy. We should be bringing it every single day, even if we are dripping in blood impure. And the Korban Pesach, the, the Passover offering, which is, um, if you don't bring it and you're supposed to, well, it's karet. It's the worst punishment there is, getting cut off from Israel. And, and the Rebbe spoke about this right after the Six-Day War, that uh, whoever lives in Yerushalayim should leave for Pesach. They should not uh, stay there because uh, it's a very big deal. And when the Rebbe saw that the peace process is back, reversing all the successes of the Six-Day War, then the Reb, after a couple of years and giving back land and re reversing all the miracles that Hashem made for us, the Reb is like, okay, whatever, the situation is not the same anymore. At least they won't have to leave Yibal. Yerushalayim every... every... So, so we are, to, if, if we started, if someone said to us right now in the government, you can bring a korban, um, we could literally be organized from where we're holding right now in three hours, be up there making a sacrifice. And not only that, but one hour later, we could be back down and bring the, bring the altar with us. There would be no, there would be no complaints. So this is, this is another thing I want to say that uh, I've been in touch with the Temple Institute. And uh, Which uh, I'm trying to get to uh, Rabbi Elia. Uh, Elia. I, I was in touch with Gilad. You know Gilad? 
He's yeah, but okay. He's uh okay. So he told me that he's going to talk and see. He, they're definitely interested in what we're doing. Not to mention the fact that for the last three weeks, every single article from the Temple Institute has been about the Sanhedrin. <laughs> uh, really, I don't know that. Almost, almost, yeah. So it's definitely a hot topic right now, all over the place, and it's it's the topic. Um, hmm. Uh, so the Temple Institute is interested, and they're going to see how they can uh, join the Sanhedrin initiative here. And uh, the Davidic dynasty, hopefully, will also be able to uh, uh, create uh, new uh, connections over there as well, more stronger. So yeah, all these things are in place. Everything um, is in place. It's all about connecting <clears throat> the plug so, so to the, the outlet. So I want to be specific. Um, when it comes to the Davidic dynasty, I... I'm not going to say, oh, that one. I love Mitchell Dan. I asked him. Yeah. I asked Rabbi Yosef Berger. I'm not the one to choose. Right. I'm not the one the to choose the Sanhedrin. Will need to choose. I'm not even the one to choose the Sanhedrin. So what will be what will be. The, uh, the, by the way, another thing, another purpose that I think the Sanhedrin will have to fulfill is you were talking a little bit about the Galut mentality, the exile mentality. It is so, it has permeated what we think of as Judaism so deeply that one of the things they will have to do is an entirely comprehensive overhaul of Judaism. A hundred percent. And it's, it's because there's so many things, even in the practical everyday halachas. Psychologically, this is an open heart surgery, an open brain surgery. Uh, an, another, another story. Um, I was shocked. Um, there's a tailor, God bless him, uh, Reuven Prager, in Jerusalem. He makes Begad Ivri. He's an awesome guy. Um, about 25 years ago, he walked up to his Rav, and he said, he's a, he's a, he's a Levi, so he's a bit of a Kanai, a zealot. Um, he says, I'm a Levi, but how does he put it? Um, in, in service. I am right now servicing, serving as an... Ba as a ba yeah, he's, he's intense. Um... And he, he said, why are we not doing machatzit shekel, the half shekel? And they said, we do. We give charity every year. So every year, the chief rabbis set out, this is how much the half shekel is worth. Give this much money to charity on Purim, and you're, you've fulfilled the commandment. But that's not what the Torah says. The Torah says you have to bring a half shekel weight of silver, and it is hekdesh. It is used for exclusively for the temple. One hundred percent. So, what did Reuven Prager do? He went to a guy who makes coins, and he said, "I want to make a, she- a, 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 a coin out of pure silver, and it has to weigh precisely this much." How simple is that? Well, it actually got a little complicated because. After minting the coins, and he mints them every year, and he makes a new design every year. After minting the coins, um, you actually don't purchase the coin. You actually have to purchase the coin from him and then give it back to him. (laughs) And he takes it, and he actually collects them. So he would take them to Brinks, okay? And he has a place in Brinks where he keeps his, thank you, where he keeps all of the coins that have been collected over the last 24, five years, um, and he insures them for their worth plus 20%, and um, the and these silver coins are waiting for the temple. Wow. So there's there actually... Millions of dollars worth of silver. Millions of dollars. Millions of dollars worth of silver. Just waiting for the Sanhedrin to get their act together. And he actually approached the Sanhedrin and said, do you want to take this from me? And they're like, No. And he went to the chief rabbinate, and they're like, "Go away, nut job." And when I wrote about this story, I've been I bought three of the. I have to buy more. I have to go back and get my coin this year. Um, I buy two and give him one. Um, he actually has this program where you buy the coin and he gives it to a soldier because in the Torah it's called pidyon nefesh, so it protects the soldiers. But when I read when I wrote this story, I was thinking. It's written explicitly in the Torah. We read it. <clears throat> Not wow. to mention when all the Jews have to be counted, they all have to get a machatis a shekel. Yeah. And, and I was like... <coughs> put it in a box so that 
so that we know how many yidden there are. And I was like, I don't. It's not optional. It's not optional. It's not like <laughs> oh, we haven't done it for a while, so we're not going to do it again. Oh, where does it say that? I want to talk about also a psychological thing, which is, I I, I say this every time because it's such a it's such a good example. The grasshoppers, they have a time when they're all colorful and they look like the rainbow and everything. And then they have a time when they have mass, they kind of start to grow these thick armor plates. They turn gray and then they become like a tank. And then that's when you have Makas Arbe. They just go out and purge a country and just swallow up everything. So what I'm trying to say is is that every, every 50 to 100 years, for the last 2,000 years, the Yiddish nation has been through gullus after gullus after gullus after the Inquisition. We had this and that and the, you know, and the Holocaust. So they have the time when they go on the offense and they go and they attack the country or the fields, whatever, whatever it is. And that is kind of what we need to do as Yidden right now. We need to understand that the Gulf is over. It's over. We have millions of Yidden in Eretz Yisrael. Ladies and gentlemen, your time to shine is now. And uh, and we have to, and, you know, every day is Pikuach Nefesh, that the Sanhedrin doesn't exist. The world is spiraling out of control. We have We have to turn the New World Order into the Jew World Order. <laughs> we need to... Uh, we need to give a narrative that makes sense. Right now, the, the leadership in the world, regardless of the Jews, is, uh, is, 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 is terrible. It's horrible. It's devil worshipping. It's, it's, it's very, very sticky. I don't even want to go there. Right. The point is, and, I'm not, and I'm not, and I'm not going to be uh, being machadish anything to anybody. Everybody already knows the situation, the darkness, all the details of the darkness. But what we don't understand is that the darkness only exists in the absence of light. And we need to uh, we need to add in light. That's what we need to do. We need to go on the offense as far as Golos is concerned. We need to establish a Sanhedrin, an advisory board. We need to establish a king. We need to push away the enemies of the Jewish people. We need to establish the temple, the, build, the Vesa Mikdash. Right now we're only... We're, we're, we're only being Mekayim Paz Mitzvahs, which is 87 Mitzvahs out of the 613. So that's like less than a quarter of our spiritual potential. Mm -hmm. No wonder we're not seeing any miracles. No wonder the prophets aren't getting prophecy, even though... And Mitzvahs are really, um, the more you do, the more light and spiritual energy comes into the world. I've noticed, I think one of the reasons why... The Jews are finally allowed to go up to the Temple Mount, and we're getting more and more um, of a presence, and more, uh, and we're succeeding on the Temple Mount. I think one of the reasons, <laughs> God bless them, uh, the Muslims know how to daven; they know how to pray. Uh, in some ways, better than us. Five times a day, they they they're, they're very careful about washing before they pray, and they're like praying for them is like I remember I used to work with Muslims in kitchens. They were like they prayed. But they don't learn. A lot of these imams, they're illiterate. Um, they don't learn. So they don't see anything in learning. And we're kind of like... And it's funny, the name Yishmael is Hashem Ohir. They, they know about praying. It's and they, and they, they've definitely inspired the fear of heaven in the Christian community with all their uh, jihad. God willing, God willing. <laughs> if the Christians knew what, what Islam made of Jesus, they would... They would really react strongly but um well this is I, also the place to uh, shout out to a few of the the noahide community like eliyahu zerubbabel that he goes by i'm sure you heard of him and uh well, yeah we have to we have to become friends again and, uh, and that won't be easy <laughs> and uh david butts which has been helping me with the sanhedrin market and uh, his group his team he has a few uh, people that he brought to the uh, lion and the lamb whatsapp group and uh, and everybody else, everybody else. I can't go through everybody, but the point is, I want to give credit where credit is due, because we have a lot of Noahides that have done a lot for the Jewish community, um, without the Jewish community knowing about it. Kind of, they're just, they're just there working very hard for Hashem, uh, and at a lot of, and it's at a, at a great price to their own personal life. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think, I think, um, yeah, I think uh, that that um, I've seen among Christians that the Jewish return to Israel, and more specifically the Jewish return to Jerusalem, has been hugely transformative. And this, according to Hasidus, it explains that a non-Jew wants the Geula more than the Jews, and that's why Bilam was the first prophet of the Geula. Uh, he... Uh, we're done. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Um, Bilam is, is with his donkey, and I, I won't say more. Uh, was the first prophet of the Geula. The reason for that being, because the non-Jews need the Geula more than the Jews. We at least have the eighty-seven mitzvahs that we can catch on to and cling to and connect to Hashem with Shabbos and Tefillin, and if in Kashrus. The non-Jews, they have the Sheva Mitzvahs B'nai Noach, and they're only obligated to do them if a Jew commands them to do it. And obviously the Sheva Mitzvahs B'nai Noach is kind of a gate to the rest of the Torah. They can kind of, if they learn the Sheva Mitzvahs properly, they'll, they'll kind of get to the 613 laws. That's another little note that I'm going to throw in there. Not to mention the fact that the Sheva Mitzvahs B'nai Noach, this minimum is... That's the covenant Hashem has with us of not destroying this world with Naya. It's, it's a minimum, it's not the maximum. Yeah, but it's also the... Hashem, Hashem, Hashem made a marble and Naya was saved. Hashem. And Hashem's guarantee that we continue to exist on this world is the Sheva Mitzvah. So if you see the world turning into garbage before your very eyes, you should definitely know that we need to push the, she, the Sheva Mitzvah B'nai Naya, the seven laws of Noah, more and more and more. That just means that we're destroying our covenant with the Creator. Now, moving back into the, to the if, if I can, I want to make uh, I want to finish a point that I that I started before. Sorry, I, I apologize. But uh, so I was very surprised when to find out that when I went up to the Temple Mount, there have been study sessions going on. They would scream at Jews who 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 lowered their head, who m mumbled or moved their lips or anything that looked like like prayer. They would kick you off the mount. You'd get uh, blacklisted by the police. Anything that even looked like prayer. So I was shocked when I went up and I saw that there was a Rav Eliyahu. They'd be doing their tour and then he would stop. And he'd sit down and he wasn't, wasn't allowed to bring any books up. But they would have a study session on the Temple Mount. And I was floored. I'm like, you won't allow prayer, but you'll allow Torah study. And I really think that it was on the merit of that Torah study that it pushed the doors open. Um, that now Jews are actually allowed to have minyanim. We're allowed to pray up there in forms. We're not allowed to take tefillin. We're not allowed to take a talis. We're not allowed to, um, to take a Sefer Torah. Um, we're not allowed up on Shabbos, and we can't daven at night. But there are minyanim up there. You can go up and there are... Ten men standing there saying full prayers. It's really quite beautiful. And they're, of course, saying it either off their cell phone or... Yeah, that's amazing. And, of course, this is... this is. Uh, and there's also the group that... You, did you see the uh, group that they dress up like Muslims to get onto the Temple Mount? That is a lie. No? It is a... It is a propaganda piece set up by the Shin Bet. It is a lie. Okay. Um, the Shin Bet... Uh, the Secret Service, they have what they call the Jewish Division, which is entirely political. They operate against the right wing. Wow. Okay, that's all. The, and they're not even ashamed about it. You ask, well, what about the left wing? Oh, there are no left wing terrorists. No, but there are left wings who help Arab terrorists. We know that. We've caught them. Um, so they made this narrative to they be made legitimized? This to me, I used to live in a, uh, in a place in... Um, yeah, I used to live in a place called Bahrain, and I know for a fact that the Shin Bet um, will not only incite and try to get people angry, they'll usually pick a guy who's a nut job, um, who's a little bit mentally unstable, and they'll get him to like become like the the organizer of a of a right wing underground movement, um, and they put they put people in jail for that. Yeah. So uh, okay. And Good in tunnel. this case. I, I know the I, I I specifically know the, also the I specifically know the guy that was in the news report, um, and he's been accused of twenty different other things, and they actually arrested him, and took him to jail, took him to court, and he got acquitted. He got acquitted. Why? Because it was a lie. 
they only did it because if there are no people like this, then there's no reason to have these Shin Bet people working. Mm. They would go home. They would be retired or writing parking tickets. Mm -hmm. um, I know the people that they stop. And they're just stopping the same, like, two guys over and over again. It's a lie. Mm -hmm. And the problem in this case was a couple weeks later, the Waqif, the Muslim authority on the Temple Mount, stopped a Muslim because they thought he was a Jew. And it was a lie. It's a it's a total total lie, um, and it's it's the, I've seen the 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 the, the Shabak try to get these things together, and unfortunately, um, I've noticed over the last two decades that they have managed they have created a reaction um, amongst amongst the youth. Um, when I was twenty five years ago, um, the settler youth. I remember the, the, the kids who were teenagers when I was living in Bahrain, they snuck into the Arab village, which is an awful Arab village. Um, they snuck in um, in the middle of the night, and the mosque has the muazin, the um, call to prayer. Um, but it's the first call to prayer is way before dawn, so it's taped. It's on and it's on a it's on a timer, and they replaced the CD with a CD of Rav Shlomo Karlibach. <laughs> so the Arabs woke up, ta, ta, kol, ha, and, and they're like, and that's what they used to do. That's cute, that's cute. Unfortunately, 15 years ago, um, the very same Arabs, um, one of them came into our town and killed, uh, killed a man, and then another one came later and killed a small boy, and then it, it was confrontation. It wasn't, um, it wasn't jokes and games anymore. It wasn't jokes and games anymore. And that's when I noticed the 15-year-old boys, you know, someone said, oh, they're throwing rocks at Arabs. I'm like, Jews don't throw rocks at Arabs. And now they do. Um, so that really, I think, came from, it was a gift from the... Uh, Shabak. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, this is... This is uh, the government's job is to... I don't know. It's none of our business. We're dealing with lights. I'm trying to... This whole Sanhedrin initiative... Is supposed to be a exit of the matrix. Um, everybody yeah. is seeing. We all see the game. I want to point out um, <clears throat> the um, European kings. They used to go to great efforts to establish their closer to the mic. I, they used to go to great efforts to establish their ancestry um, with the kingship of David, meaning you would have the king of England. This totally non-Jewish, never connected to any one Jewish person, and he would have this beautiful chart showing how he was actually descended from King David. And that was all dynasties, all monarchies in Europe. Um, because the only thing that can give you the right to be a king is from King David, who was anointed by Shmuel, by Samuel. Um, it's the only, I mean, and that was clear in the By the, the way, Bible. Just, just to put a note, it's very possible that, 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 they, that those charts were accurate because Shlema Amalek, he might was been. a busy man. <laughs> <laughs> it might, might be, might be, yeah. but it was important to them. Um, and it should be important to us. And, uh, and m I think um, m m many modern institutions, if they have any claims to any ideological basis, they will go even if they're secular. They'll they'll, they'll base it in something at least similar to the, to the Bible. I also want to say that right now, if you look at the Knesset and how they mumble jumble, I think it's a chilol Hashem every day that the Knesset is is in session. Yeah, it's just my my, my kids' kindergarten. If they would have put a live camera on how my kids play in the kindergarten, it's more disciplined than what's going on in the Knesset. Um, that's because the Knesset also, it's like we had this recent crisis where we did how many? Four elections, three elections in, in yeah. a couple of years. And why? The first Knesset, how was it established? Ben-Gurion, who I was taught as a secular Jew, he was like, oh, Papa Ben-Gurion. Um, he was not a nice guy. Um, he actually has Jewish blood on his hands. Um, he was not a nice guy. He was a socialist involved in the socialist revolutions. Uh, Good he, friends with Lenin. 
Yeah, exactly. I no no exaggeration. Um, so when he established Israel, he was not establishing an, a Jewish state. He was establishing a state. He was very power hungry. So the first Knesset was not elected. The first Knesset, he had, there was the Rolozov thing where he really eliminated the right wing in a lot of ways. Um, Menachem Begin, the Altalena, getting rid of them militarily, getting rid of them politically, making everyone hate the right wing. Um, and when it came time for the first Knesset, what did he say? All the people who are my friends, they're in. It wasn't even a democracy. It was not a democracy. And if you do that, how long will it take popular elections to change that? The people who are in power tend to stay in power. So, and that's what happened. And it was 30 some years. And it was like a major thing in Israel when Menachem Begin was elected. It was a total... It was, this is why also I want to say that in the beginning we had, we had thoughts. And, and I want to point out, what was the difference between Menachem Begin and Ben-Gurion? They were both secular-ish, um, but Ben-Gurion was anti-religion. And Menachem Begin, he said, I'm not going to be religious, but you know something? It's a Jewish state. He, when he was a politician... And he went overseas. He was very careful, unlike all the other Israeli politicians, to only eat kosher. He said, "I'm representing Israel," um, and he he that's and it was a major uh, revolution. Shift, yeah. Oh, when he was, and and so I think that was the return, the the, the the legitimacy, and we're seeing this now: an Arab ruling over Jews. I'm not a xenophobe or racist, but. This is Israel. You this got, is Israel. You got to call it straight. You know, we didn't. You know, the, there were no Arabs going into the gas chambers eighty years ago. Um, there were no Arabs praying to return to Israel for two thousand years. It was us. This is our. We are like the 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 Native American Indians looking at uh, Dakota and 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 Idaho and saying mm, our ancestors are buried there. You go to Harazet. You go to the Mount of Olives. Our ancestors are buried here. Everything in our history happened here. We prayed for it for 2,000 years. I'm not going to have a oh, son, and by the a way, son of I, I Ishmael spoke telling me what to do What to do in my land. This, this uh, older gentleman that I was speaking to maybe a year or two ago, friends of uh, David, the older man, uh, what's his name? He looks like a Leo Anovi, walks around with a, with a stick. With the glasses. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so he told me, when I started talking to him about maybe trying to change the political system from within, maybe strengthening the right wing and all that, he told me, this is like a building that's already collapsing, but the people on the top floor don't feel it yet. The political system, as you know it, is is over. The government's proof was we didn't have a we didn't have a prime minister we didn't have an effective election for three years no one noticed. No. <laughs> so, for us to continue investing in a system that is just breathing its last breath and has no legitimacy and has no legitimacy Alpitera and LP Seichel is a waste of time. We need to create a new narrative. We need to give people a boat to jump onto when everything else falls down. And that's why we plan on having the Sanhedrin market, which will be an e-commerce that people can use to do business with, to, cha to exchange goods. And literally, it will be so that Yidin should be able to continue having Parnassah no matter whatever is going on it's, outside. By the way, that's why I disagree with you about the police. Talk to me about that. I okay. want to hear. I want to hear constructive criticism. Okay, if I'm walking down the street, I'm jaywalking, I'm littering, or whatever, and a cop walks up to me now, it's one of the reasons I don't have a driver's license. Why don't I have a driver's license? Because it always bothered me that I, I am driving my car and some guy um, can walk up to me and all of a sudden be my king and be like. I'm going to tell you that you are evil and da, 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 and take your money. And I'm like, mm, the difference between you and a guy without a badge is what? You know? A pirate. Right. Yeah. Um, whereas if if it's shoftim vishotrim, um, the judges and the police, if, if I'm walking down the street and I litter or something and a policeman, the writer from the Torah, walks up to me, 
And he says, I have to take you to court. If I accept that and go with him, I'm doing a mitzvah. I'm doing a, I'm doing a commandment. I'm doing what God told me to do. Well, first of all, um, I don't think that Sanhedrin would take you to Basedin for throwing a wrapper on the floor. Uh, and, 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 and let me just let me just put it out there. Right now, the way the government works is every issue can be solved very simply. It's called taking more money from the from the body, right, 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 right. from the people. That's not how the Sanhedrin works. The Sanhedrin actually wants to solve issues, and they're not supposed to be biased. And it's not about money. The the whole our entire mentality of thinking that every everything that we do, we have to get our money taken away from us, is messed up. It's a gullus derangement syndrome. It is terrible. It is horrible, and it is detriment to. If if I can it, prove it to comes, someone, it comes from the headspace of. What gives me legitimacy? If I've been driving a bike since I was three years old, and a helmet bothers me from it does it disturbs me from driving driving a bike correctly, or it endangers me because when when a driver sees me with a helmet, he says, "Oh, I can get a little closer to him." He has a helmet. If something's going to happen, or whatever it is, if I feel that a helmet is not good for me, and someone else is going to take my money every time he sees me without or without a mask or whatever whatever it is, that's not the way the Sanhedrin works. It right. says, "Vahaser mimenu yagain vaanocha." It will take away from us anguish and anxiety. Today, if a cop comes up to you, he's giving you anxiety. So I'm very involved in, in, in American politics. And what you're saying is very true because um, it's like saying, why do they have legitimacy? They have legitimacy because they can take my money and because they have a lot of money and they control a lot of money. And they we, threaten you with a gun if you don't listen to them. Right. Which is, yeah, it's a, so now they'll bring you back to the station so, as, as ground beef. And then on the paper, they'll write, the reason why we broke his ribs is because uh, he tried to attack a police officer. <laughs> so I was, I'm on the news way too much. I'm on the, 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 the internet. And in the, in, the last, um, in the last budget bill for more money that Biden tried to pass, which thank God it didn't, um, there was no discussion about what was in it. Was it justified? Would it do good? There was no discussion about that. The discussion was about how much money can he take? And it was very clear to all um, involved that he had already taken way too much and was destroying the, was, was, was burning the, uh, the economy. To a point that he was burning the economy. Right. But, so why did he do it? He did it because it gave him legitimacy. I can take this power, so I am president. No, the 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 legitimacy of the Sanhedrin does not come from that, and to be honest, the legitimacy of the king does not come from that. Um, this is it's, a morally and ethically based system. And not only that, I was always impressed when I read um, the the Mishnahs about um, a king, and also about the Kohen Gadol. They're very similar. They're not allowed to. Um, to do certain things. For example, when they're mourning, they're not allowed to allow their hair to grow, to allow their nails to grow, to stop bathing. They have to be presentable. And why? Not because of they're so respectable, because it's not their respect. I, uh, 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 I have to show respect for my ra rabbi and my father. My father can say, nah, get over it. My rabbi cannot. Why? Because my father, he brought me into this world. That's something he did. But the, my rabbi, I have to show respect for the Torah that's in him. It's not his respect. The king, it's not his respect. The Sanhedrin, there's, their legitimacy does not come from them. Their legitimacy comes from who they serve. They are, like it says in Tehillim, they are hollow in as they are just a vessel for the Torah and for Hashem's message. And the more bittle they are, right. and the more right. and the more uh, they are, that's the more they... Are legitimate in in what they are doing in the Sanhedrin. Uh, now, it's very possible that in the first stages of the Sanhedrin, um, there is going to be shaitan. Because again, as I told you earlier, we are we are aiming for the complete Yemei Mashiach, a hundred percent Gula Mitis Vashlema version of the Sanhedrin. It's very, but it's possible that in the beginning there will be shaitan. If that if that makes any sense. But I'm telling you, long term, and as far as I learned about in Yonagol Moshiach in, in the Chabad uh, uh, perspective for seven years, in the ultimate version of the Geula, there's no Shaitan. 
And really? I, th I think that's an, I think that's a beautiful thing, and uh, and and I hope that Am Yisrael will be on the caliber yeah. to be able to live their life on that level. You know, I hear that. I mean, very clearly, where I'm holding right now is, I don't think we're there yet. I think that right now the stage we're at is we are still re in the in gathering of the exiles. We're coming back. Um, uh, we which, still need to be used to the way Gullus works a little bit. I mean, which, 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 I think, is it Micha? Where he says, you're sitting in beautiful tiled houses and I don't have a house. And I, I, that's where we are. You know, okay, we came back and thank God the kibbutzim and the Zionists, they, they, they built up the land. And, eh, but what have we done for Hashem? And the Torah is still the Torah that they had in Poland and in Muncie, New York. And, and the proof is that the, 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 the religious Jews outside of Israel, their Judaism is fine. They can't, they, what they do out there, they can't do any better. My joke Israel. is that when you go to, when, when the Chabad said them go to the Rebbe, your, your visit to the Rebbe is incomplete unless you bought a nice big slice of New York pizza from the kosher store. You know, just to make sure that your connection to the Rebbe is solid. You know, what I'm trying to say is that uh, also the, it's also this stop and drop quick, you know, drive through Judaism. Right, right. The, the, the right, mitzvah right, tank right, right, also. Right, right. It, Whereas Israel is not stop and drop. Living here is not stop and drop. You know, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, they, they have an expression. The Americans have this quick they, they have answer to every quick thing. You, you see these three minute videos explaining these very complicated things. And the guy, what are you doing? You're just ruining the whole thing. You're just plowing through this topic. In Israel, you're not plowing. You're, you, you, you come here. It's work. You, it's work. And when you make it through the day, you know you made it through the day. You felt it. It's, <laughs> it's a real, real experience. And we're still coming back from the Galut. We have to, you know, you, you can take the Jew out of the Galut, but you can't take the Galut out of the Jew. Well, we're here we, to do that. We are, we are the to, dentist. <laughs> we are here to do that, to take the exile out of, out of the Torah. Um... And out of the Jew, the exile and of the out Jew. of the Jew. Yeah. Uh, no, I think out of the Torah as well. Yes, out yes. of the Torah that they've brought back with from them from the exile, which is not. I mean, ugh, God bless them. I don't. I'm, I'm. God forbid, not saying anything bad about the actual rabbis, but the first government. Was, I, have a, I have a joke. I have a joke. Well, not the. <laughs> you know why people have so much back pain these days? It's not because they're bent over on their cell phones. Because they're not getting lashes from the Sanhedrin. <laughs> Okay, keep okay. going, keep going. So, the, 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 the concept of a chief rabbinate is not a Jewish concept. It is not, we, our concept is the Sanhedrin. So who set it up? The first Israeli government, which was anti-religious. And it was, for them, it was like, uh, he's our trained Jew, you know, our trained rabbi. There's also, um, if you want to go, Vad Arba Ha'arses, which was the, the council of the four lands, was a Jewish rabbinate council in Europe during the time of the Baal Shem Tov, or earlier than the time of the Baal Shem Tov. We're talking nine generations back. And uh, again, all these things are, are, are improvisations for a Gullus situation. This is why, again, the Sanhedrin uh, narrative that we're talking about, the, 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 the Sanhedrin initiative that we're talking about is... Okay, we've graduated. Let's move on and let's get the real deal. Let's. The Rebbe says, let's do everything that we can to bring about Mashiach. Everybody knows the Rebbe said, Tut al Tvasar Kent, yeah? The famous, uh, you know, Sicha. And the Rebbe even said that I've done, everything I've done is la Hevel Villarik, is to spit and for nothing. The same thing that Nikola Tesla said. He said that I've served, my, my entire life was in the service of humanity and I have nothing to show for it. And even though he brought electricity to the modern world, a few businessmen came, they took the electricity, they turned it into something that's a business. They did not allow him to continue with the free energy process. The Rebbe created a, the Chassidim, what the Chassidim did and the Shlichos and everything they did was very, very good. But in Tavshin and Aleph, towards a year before the Rebbe had the final stroke, after 40 years of working tirelessly, the Rebbe says, everything I've done was nothing because you guys didn't get the point. I was saying one thing, you guys were turning me into Moshe Rabbeinu. You guys were not understanding what I saw. The Rebbe, the Rebbe saw Hitler. The Rebbe saw the potential of Malchus doing terrible things. 
and the Rebbe wanted to give the Malchus back to Am Yisrael, and the Rebbe wanted to pump them all the way to the Geula, he wanted them to have the Malchus. And as we learn in Chassidus, you have Chochma bin Adas, Chesed, Gvur, Teferes, Netzach, Yisrael. You can have everything. You can have Agmach, you can have whatever you want. You can have Rabbanim, you can have whatever you want. If you don't have the Malchus, the Yisrael doesn't sit on it. Mm. The, the foundation doesn't sit on the Malchus. Mm. It's eventually going to expire. So yeah, so we don't we don't we don't even. I mean, it says you know we know that there are three there are three three crowns for Israel: Torah, Kuna, and Kesar Shemtov, uh, Kesar Kuna, and Kesar Malchus. Kesar Shemtov is, is is reputation. Kuna and Kesar Malchus. Yeah, Kesar Malchus. So reputation so, is the Sanhedrin. So there was a problem in the Chesmonayim that they were Kohanim and they took on Kesar Malchus, and so they ended up in a bad place. And if you think about it, all we're left with these days is Ketar Torah. And the Kohanim, it's like, ah, okay, they do a little bit, uh, Kohanim. Yeah, uh, the, the Sanhedrin organized a creation concert in the, the Davidson, the south wall of the, of the Kotel. Um, and it was the week before Rosh Hashanah, a bunch of years ago. Why? Because that's the anniversary of the creation of the world. So they said, okay, the whole world should be into this. That's when the world was created. It's the anniversary of the creation of the world. And part of the concert, they had an actual orchestra playing amazing music. Um, and then they had at one point Kohanim dressed in full dress co- uh, Kohuna garb. Kohuna garb on the ramparts, looking down at the people blowing shofar out. And it's at night in the spot. And I was just, oh my gosh. And we need to return to this. Judaism is not sitting in the Beit Knesset so that some Arab can break in and try to kill you. No. We're, get out of the shtibel, we're ladies. Jews, we're get out of the shtibel. Come back to Israel. We're not... Um, and, and the Rabbanut, it's so funny. They're not... They've been doing the same thing for 2,000 years, and it's not... By the way, you have to be, you have to be psychologically numb to, to, to open up a siddur every single day and go through your shopping list of Geula necessities, you have, to be, you have to be numb and depressed. I mean, how depressing is it to daven three times a day, you wrap the film, you go to Minyan, that's why they're rushing through the davening, it's so painful. It's so painful because you're, you're davening, what are you saying? You're saying, so, And you're not doing anything about that. So I even sat down after Mincha, here, we had a minion for, a side minion without a mask. And we sat down after Mincha, and I asked, one, I asked some of the people to sign up to the Sanhedrin event on our website, mnglobal.org. And he said, I can't do it, because I need to get an okay from my rabbi. And my rabbi is dead. <laughs> so, so one of one of my traits as a as a as a reporter, as a as, as a journalist, every morning I sit down with my editor, and we're like, okay, so what are we going to write about today? And every once in a while, I'll say, okay, here's this story, and he'll be like, well, what's the story? And I'm like, I don't know, I haven't written it yet. And I think that's this, that's that's really necessary for Geula. We've never, you know. Mashiach has never happened before. Geula has never happened before. The last so, time was two thousand years ago. We're not very familiar with what how it went down. Right. So 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 we 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 need to see how it unfolds without any pre expectations. So, but it it is unprecedented, and we've been doing the same thing for two thousand years. And we all those things that are not part of the Geula that have not that have been done over and over again for two thousand years. We have to get rid of them. One of them is, it's funny, the, the chief rabbinate, there's a big dilemma right now um, coming from the minister of religion, um, and it's challenging two things. One is uh, that now they want to, the, the, the rabbinate has had a uh, monopoly on, on kashrut certificates, which, eh, to be really honest, if you want to eat non-kosher food in Israel, you really got to look for it. <laughs> you really get, it is like I love the fact that I when I whenever I go back to the states I, I have to consciously remember okay you've got to look for kosher food in Israel you don't have to look for kosher food and not only that I walk into some place looking like this I, I remember once I was in Tel Aviv and I start to cross the street towards a restaurant uh, like a like a falafel store or something and the guy working behind the counter just looks up and he goes no 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 because he knows I'm religious it was Tel Aviv Okay, you have to really, especially outside. I 
Passover even. I love the fact that, you know, every single, well, no, there are a few markets here that cater to non-Jews and, but you really got to look because we are in Eretz Israel. So who cares about kosher? It's going to be kosher. Okay. Um, but the other thing is um, Geros, uh, conversion. Okay. Which is Geula. It has never happened before. It has never, until a hundred years ago, it was illegal in most of the world for non-Jews to convert to Judaism. It was illegal. Um, so, and it was crazy to do it. The only people who do it. And so the rabbis don't know how to cope with it. And they're, and they're handling it horribly. So this is something that Rabbi David Bar Chaim spoke. And I just want to add, and this is, conversion is the ingathering of the exiles. It's the one that you think that ingathering of the exiles is is religious Jews uh, getting a plane ticket, going to a uh, travel agent and coming to Israel. No. It's also the Bnei Menashe coming from India, the Ethiopian Jews, people coming from places you wouldn't expect. Yes, okay, so let's wrap this up. The point is, okay. we're trying to bring this on headed. We gave you a lot of information here. Me and Adam Berkowitz in the Golan Heights, drinking tea on these cold winter days. <laughs> uh, and Be'ez uh, Hashem, we have enough information for you to take. And uh, if you want to register, sign up, non -commit, no commitment necessary, on MN Global, MN Mashiach News, global .org, on the Sanhedrin events page.